Yesterday's thought-provoking discussions have proven the importance of bringing together uh, scholars from a variety of disciplines to address the topic of the commons. The first panel unpacked the politics of visibility and invisibility of urban infrastructure, analog, analog, analog and digital, and examine commons as a social reproduction and cohabitation versus commons as a political project. The next panel had demonstrated a variety of commoning tactics from protest, protest, hashtags, participatory architecture, and mo moving across borders, noting complexities around reappropriating power-infused tools such as maps and urban planning, and the importance of considering multiple scales, temporalities, and imaginations within the debate about the commons. I am excited to see how these debates further unfold today. My name is Michal, and together with my colleagues, Konstantinos and Alex, we are honored to be hosting the spiritual conference in association with the Martin Center and the Center for Research in the Arts, Social Science and Humanities at the University of Cambridge. As I have mentioned yesterday, um, it is important for us to note uh, that this was intended to be a physical conference, but the recent pandemic led us to turn it into a virtual event. Uh, during a time of enforced distance and mass protests for social justice, it seems important to us to curve out some space, even virtually for collective reflection on the commons. And, and just to clarify once again, as I did yesterday, by commons, we refer not only to the natural environment and its resources, but also to shared social creation and results that result from human labor, such as public space, information, culture and ideas, and new technologicals and cyberspace. Importantly, we envision commoning as an ongoing collective practice and ethos that does not merely concern an end, but also a means, a process. This virtual conference will inquire into the relevance of the common in an age of digital transformation, mounting inequalities, racial violence, and a global pandemic. We ask whether this new reality can become the basis for new practices of commoning, from the socialization of goods, healthcare and digital content, two radical forms of collaboration, collective care and com community solidarity. And I am now going to hand on to my colleague, Konstantinos. Thank you, Michal. Hi everyone, I am Konstantinos and together we'll be discussing about reclaiming the cultural commons. This panel will look at contestations around cultural commons and strategies to reclaim and remobilize them. The unfolding global health pandemic urges us to think about its repercussions to the basic rights of access to culture, to the diversity of cultural content and expression online, and to the precarious, now more than ever, art and cultural labor. In addition, how can widespread protest against institutional racism, toxic philanthropy, art washing, and gender inequalities help us to envision museums taking the side of the commons? How can culture and aesthetics serve as innovative terrains for encounters and exchanges, solidarity and sharing, synergies and community building? To address these issues and many others, it is our great pleasure to have with us today some esteemed speakers. Our distinguished guests are thinkers and curators, activists and practitioners with vast experience in the ins and outs of exhibition making and in the politics of cultural institutions. I will now present all the speakers and they will then deliver their, their presentations respectively. Gavin Grindon is a lecturer in art history and curating at the University of Essex. In 2014, he co-curated the exhibition Disobedient Objects at the V&A Museum in London, and he currently co-curates the Museum of Neoliberalism in South London. He has been a member of Liberate Tate, an activist group that deployed performance interventions in Tate spaces, pressuring Tate successfully to drop BP sponsorship in 2016. Ella McPherson is a senior lecturer in the sociology of, the, of new media and digital technology at the University of Cambridge. As a co-director of the Center of Governance and Human Rights, 
She leads the research team on human rights in the digital age. She is also on the executive committee of Cambridge's Trust and Technology Initiative and leads the Whistle, an academic startup that aims to support the collection and analysis of digital human rights evidence. Pelin Tan is a senior researcher at the Center for Arts, Design and Social Research in Boston, and she is a lead author at the Cities and Social Progress at the International Panel on Social Progress. She is also the sixth recipient of the Keith Haring Fellowship in Art and Activism at Bard College. She is a member of Silent University and she has written extensively on alternative modes of pedagogy, urban conflict, and soci socially engaged art practices. Last but not least, Sepaki Angyama is the artistic director of INIVA, the Institute for International Visual Art in London. She was head of education for Documenta 14, director of education at Manifesta 10, and co-curator of the third edition of the Chicago Architecture Biennial. Her praxis stems from radical pedagogies, black feminist thought, and the rethinking of human and non-human relation. Now, I would like to invite Gavin to start with his presentation. Great. Okay. Now we can hear you, perfect. Great. Um, hi everyone, uh, so I'm gonna talk uh, very briefly, um, less a kind of theoretical overview, more of my, like a case study. I'm gonna talk about protest in museums. Um, and uh, as Constantine has mentioned, um, I'm gonna talk a bit about uh, my own experience as one member of Liberate Tate. Um, so, uh, if you don't know the group, Liberate Tate uh, conducted 16 uninvited performances in different Tate spaces uh, in London from 2010 to 2016. Um, kind of encouraging them yeah, to drop uh, BP funding, which eventually uh, in 2016 they did. Um, there's a few examples of some of the different performances uh, you can see there. A lot of them involved spilling fake oil inside Tate spaces. Um, but also uh, you can see they're taking uh, a 1.5 tonne wind turbine blade uh, into uh, the Tate Turbine Hall, occupying uh, the uh, Turbine Hall again overnight um, and kind of covering the floor uh, with charcoal uh, excerpts from texts about art activism and ecology. Um, and being the first, I think, group to do live tattooing in a museum, I think we beat, like someone did it at MoMA like a, a month later. Um, but again, in um, tech that's Tate Britain, you see in the bottom left there, we're smuggling in uh, everything we needed for a tattoo studio to tattoo people with the parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere uh, in the year of their birth. Uh, and again, occupying the space uh, for the length of a day. So these were kind of artistic uh, direct action performances. Um, and I'm gonna talk about this in terms of the commons, um, not just as a kind of ecologically uh, motivated uh, set of actions, um, but also because we're closely bound to the idea of the, the museum as a public space and, and the limits of that. <clears throat> Part of that comes from the origins of Liberate Tate. We were initially uh, another uh, art activist group, the Laboratory of Insurrectionary Imagination, it's a good name, were invited uh, as part of Tate's education program to give a workshop, uh, which uh, they suggested should be called Disobedience Makes History. Um, about histories of civil disobedience, disobedience in art, uh, but they gave us one instruction, which was that we couldn't criticize their sponsors. Um, and they printed the instruction out, which was not smart because we projected it on the wall and then asked all the participants, should, I mean, should we disobey the instruction? And yeah, everyone thought we should. Um, and Liberate Tape were formed out of that moment. So there's this interesting dynamic of um, the museum functioning as a public space, supporting activism, supporting par you know, participation, uh, but not too much participation. It turned out uh, what we were doing was maybe too much participation. Um, and that dynamic has framed uh, what the group has done um, ever since. So one way of uh, thinking about this also is that we didn't 
uh, think about what we were doing, uh, necessarily just in terms of like an ethical imperative or in terms of branding, but as something that was about resources um, and was about commons. Um, so this is uh, a diagram produced, you can see by Platform London, uh, campaigning arts organization um, called the Carbon Web. Uh, and this, this is kind of an important part of our thinking that when uh, big arts institutions um, are taking money from uh, oil companies, arms companies, and so on, um, those companies that aren't framing this as an act of philanthropy, but uh, as an act of extraction. Um, London, for example, is a center uh, of operations for the oil industry, particularly for BP. And they need to use the city to extract a series of services that this uh, carbon web attempts to map um, to their, their process of extracting, refining and exporting oil isn't possible uh, without establishing clearance from regulators, support from different government departments, uh, creating legal permissions to make what they do uh, functionally possible. And cultural institutions are a part of that web um, and a significant part of it, uh, that infrastructure uh, of extraction. They offer um, what uh, people in business studies call a social license to operate. Um, that kind of hegemonic notion of the normality and uh, acceptability of the oil industry um, that's brought through the presence um, of uh, these brands in um, kind of these influential spaces, art spaces that have influential publics um, and that are so, get associated very quickly with ideas of nation uh, and, and kind of social progress and all of these other uh, kind of good liberal things that, that they want to be associated with. Um, but at the same time, we were thinking um, also again about how this, this ties very neatly within the, the structure within Tate. So this, is, this uh, organogram is outdated now, um, obviously. Uh, Lord Brown and Nick Sirota have both moved on from the Tate, but at the time, for most of the time of our campaign, um, the Board of Trustees chairman at Tate was uh, John Brown, ex-CEO of BP. So these things were kind of very closely interwoven um, in terms of these, these kind of relationships of power. So one of the other kind of points I guess I could make in thinking about this is that not only do we think about this in terms of ext extraction, in terms of uh, a kind of uh, institu like a battle over institutional control and institutional resources um, that the arts institutions offered a kind of uh, a vulnerable moment in this. Um, if you've ever tried to hold a demo in the lobby of a bank, you will find you get kicked out pretty quickly by security. Um, but there's been an, an increasing wave since uh, Liberate Tate, especially since our victory in 2016 of all of these different, I showed you some of these, all these different kind of protests happening. Uh, especially in the UK and the US and in some other countries in Europe, different demonstrations uh, choosing the museum and particularly the lobbies or public spaces of museums as a site of protest. And I think that's, that's kind of a significant uh, thing that they're recognizing that these kind of spaces are spaces of leverage, uh, spaces that can be used as public spaces in ways that they, they kind of haven't been in the past uh, as often. Um, and that, that was very much a strategy for Liberate Tate to think about this, um, to kind of take the claim that museums uh, and large cultural institutions make to be uh, involved in kind of social conversations, to be public spaces, uh, spaces of kind of liberal self-expression, uh, and to treat that as if it was true, uh, and to occupy those spaces and act and push at the limits of what those spaces are capable of. And that's obviously uh, clearest when people hold a demonstration uh, in those spaces. Um, and that offered them as a, it put that doing that kind of often, especially doing it in a kind of heavily kind of artistic way, caused a dilemma uh, for these cultural institutions um, because they have a very complex relationship with social movements, with counter power, um, in that they are valorizing them, they're getting lots of kind of their, their critical value out of them, uh, and at the same time, uh, are involved in a kind of loop of uh, co-opting them, uh, limiting them in various ways, um, and also because of the ways that they're also bound up uh, with these other relations of power. Uh, one of my favorite essays on this um, 
is uh, by the critic Brian Holmes. It's quite an old essay now, I think it's from like 2006, uh, called Liar's Poker. And he says, whenever, whenever anyone talks about uh, politics in an art museum, they're lying. And it's a game of poker as to who's gonna kind of call their bluff um, and how successfully you can play the game of Liar's Poker without getting uh, called out. So one of the other groups uh, involved in these kinds of strategies, not an alternative in the US, um, have framed this uh, in terms of an idea of institutional liberation um, and thinking about, this is an essay that they wrote in Eflux magazine that you can, you can easily find online uh, and a couple of their different uh, actions there. This, the slide at the bottom is them appearing at the American Association of Museums. Uh, they set up uh, an organization they called the Natural History Museum um, and began appearing uh, as a natural history museum um, but talking about histories of climate change in a period where not many institutions were yet doing that. Um, uh, certainly natural history museums were not doing that uh, and not doing that in particularly critical ways. Um, the slide above, uh, the image above is uh, from a more recent, I think ongoing um, project that they're involved with called We Draw the Line, uh, where they're tracing um, between different institutions uh, and different sites of extraction uh, working with indigenous American communities uh, in bringing this totem pole um, through those sites and into the museum spaces, uh, along with collecting objects along the way, representing the different social struggles that it's threaded through uh, between the museum sites of extraction uh, and uh, indigenous sites of resistance. So the argument that, that they make uh, in this moment um, is one for kind of attempting to reclaim these institutions in various ways, for attempting to seed uh, inside of them. Um, and it kind of builds on uh, the kind of a lot of activist art strategies perhaps we'll uh, hear more about that have involved kind of uh, a commoning of uh, the aesthetics, uh, the values and the language uh, of fine art within social movements uh, that have produced a lot of the art activist tendencies I'm sure people will be familiar with, um, and then returning them uh, to the museum in ways that kind of problematize uh, the museum's relations to power and the things that it would normally do with an artwork. Uh, and this is one of the uh, arguments that they make here, um, is they're kind of uh, thinking about the ways in which um, people often look at the work that they're doing, the work that Liberate Tate are doing, groups like BP or not BP, um, and compare it to institutional critique that kind of they put it in a very art history frame um this is a kind of political art movement uh from starting in maybe in the early 80s late 70s um that produced work like the the hans hack artwork from i think 1984 that you see on the right there criticizing uh oil company mobile and it was produ often producing artworks uh, as fine art not necessarily as closely linked to social movements, um, criticizing uh, large corporations within the frame of, of an artwork, within the frame of the gallery. Um, and in 2005, Andrew Fraser wrote this, this kind of essay in uh, Art Forum, this influential one, from the critique of institutions to an institution of critique, where she talks about the, this kind of melancholy narrative that you get about this, this kind of art movement, that the, the, the crude version of the story would be that they made art that was politically critical, that art got bought as a commodity and circulated in the art world and was thus kind of, you know, nullified, recuperated, uh, what have you. And I think there is, there's certainly uh, a lot of truth in that critique, um, but the difference between that wave of, of institutional critique and this kind of uh, frame of institutional liberation is that all of these groups, certainly since Liberate Tate, um, would make a claim they, they haven't produced uh, artworks within those kind of frames. They're rooted in social movements and in counter power primarily. They don't necessarily need the art institutions and, and have been, you know, were ignored by them for a long time and uh, continue to be, and that, that's not necessarily a problem. Um, and that counter power, that basis in counter power um, poses more of a problem uh, for the art world because of this complex relationship that it has with it. Uh, on the one hand, it can't completely ignore it. Uh, on the other hand, it can't so easily enclose it, uh, narrativize it and recuperate it uh, in the way that it has done with uh, other kinds of conventional artworks. Um, and so things like Liberate Take kind of incrementally posed a problem uh, for the institution 
as uh, the things that we were doing started to appear on the covers of magazines in Tate's bookshop um, or would be discussed at Tate conferences or people would ask their curators questions about uh, the art that we were doing in their spaces, we were kind of leveraging open um, this public space of the museum, this idea that the, the museum was a space for these kinds of discussions uh, at the same time as it was being shut down. Um, and there was a kind of definitely a slow drift up through uh, the levels, I guess, of this, of the organization um, that were particularly kind of significant. Um, I remember that when we started out in the campaign, uh, talking to one of the curators that Tate, who described me and Liberate Tate as extremists, ecological terrorists, um, what we were doing was wholly unreasonable. Um, whereas since uh, 2016, when they, uh, they quite quietly dropped BP funding, um, they've announced a climate emergency. Uh, taking on the, the rhetoric of Extinction Rebellion. Uh, and of course, they always loved the things that we were doing uh, in their spaces and liked our work. Um, so watching that shift, that shift definitely came upwards through the institution, through the levels of this, uh, the organization. Um, and, and obviously the final point being um, when uh, Lord Brown left uh, the board of trustees at the Tate. So I guess I'm interested in this more as like a, a case study and thinking about strategies of commoning. I'm very happy to, to, to kind of discuss that. Um, and the ways in which you can leverage different kinds of institutional spaces in the art world in different ways, and some which are more vulnerable to processes of commoning, um, and some which offer different shapes and kinds of opportunities. Obviously, going for these big national museums, there was a particular uh, kind of texture to that in terms of what we were doing that wouldn't be the same for like a small visual arts organization. Um, where the relationship was would often was ve was very different, and we were often relying as well on the support infrastructurally of lots of small visual art organisations um, to be able to do the things that we did. Um, so I think I'll stop there, uh, and um, very happy to kind of discuss this and and kind of unpack uh, some of the strategies and, and theories here. Gavin, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. Um, now, uh, let's move to Ella. Hi, Ella, you have the floor. Let me unmute you. Hi, everyone. Let me just uh, pop up my slides. Um, great, thank you so much, Alex, Mihal, and Konstantinos, and Nikki for bringing us here together today. Uh, I just wanna say there's a little caveat to my presentation, which is the kids are right through that wall and I have bribed them with a movie and with chocolate chips, but there is no guarantee when you are three. So <laughs> they may come into our commons. Um, so today I wanna to talk about two vital elements of the commons, um, vital elements of activism and assembly. And these are art and accountability. And these feed the commons and are in turn nourished by the commons. So we tend to think of art as quite naturally, we think about it as a form of cultural production. Um, perhaps it's a bit more strange to think of accountability as cultural production, although not after the presentation that Gavin just gave. Um, uh, but I wanted to say that, you know, we often think of accountability as a norm or, or a value that we should be working towards. Um, but accountability like art, has its conventions, as Becker would put it. It has its practices, it has its institutions. In my research, I look in particular at the human rights piece of the accountability sphere and how this piece is adapting to the digital age. Um, and today I wanna to focus based on that research on what is revealed about the conventions of um, the sphere of art and the sphere of accountability um, when we bring them together, when they run up against each other, and what this can tell us about the range of knowledge and thus the variety of voices that flow into and out of the commons. So to do this, I'm gonna uh, have sort of three stages of my talk. Um, first, I'm gonna show you some knowledge projects of the accountability sphere venturing into the art sphere. Um, then I'm gonna show you some knowledge projects of the art sphere venturing into the accountability sphere. And then, like I said, I'll talk about implications of the conventions that are revealed for the commons. Okay. So um, to look at each phenomenon of the, the spheres moving into each other, 
I'm gonna outline three anecdotes for each direction. Um, there's one that is an exception to this uh, just because it just happened, but all of the rest of them are emblematic anecdotes, touchstones that came up several times during my ethnographic work. So people in the networks I've been studying um, featured in these anecdotes as either actors or reactors, or they told me about them. After Natale, I choose to read these anecdotes as shedding light on the sphere from which they come. So here's the first of three accountability projects that have moved into the artistic sphere. And this is one I think you'll all be familiar with. Um, the, Tate Turner, uh, the Tate's Turner Prize in 2018 had the themes of power, visibility, and truth. And one nominee was forensic architecture, which describes itself as, quote, an international research agency that uses innovative technological and architectural processes to investigate allegations of state and corporate violence. Um, and the exhibited works at this uh, Turner Prize of shortlisted exhibition were investigations into the 2017 eviction of a Bedouin village in Israel in which two individuals were killed. And these, um, these uh, sort of exhibitions, the exhibition was made up of activist footage, computer modeling, aerial images, and other text. Um, and you know, following on from this, you may have seen the headlines this week of forensic architecture's reconstruction of Mark Duggan's shooting in London by the police in 2011 that raises questions about the police account of events. Um, this particular investigation will also be in an art exhibition this autumn at the Institute of Contemporary Arts in London. And I wanna read out, coming back to the Turner Prize um, that year, one of the three themes that the, the prize was focused on um, and that's circled in yellow on the screen. So, you know, one of these was truth. So the questions raised, and this was a photograph I took of a placard as you entered the exhibition. Um, does the Turner Prize have a duty to present truth? Is the artist's truth the same as their subject's truth? Is your truth represented here? I'm gonna come back to this theme later, uh, but now I'll give you a quick overview of the two other accountability projects that have moved into the artistic sphere. Uh, War in Raqqa, Rhetoric versus Reality, was an exhibition that Amnesty International showed, and I believe it's the first kind of exhibition of this nature it's done. Um, and it was, it was at the Architectural Association School of Architecture in London, and then it came to Queen's College in Cambridge in 2019, where it was co-hosted by the Center of Governance and Human Rights. So this exhibition was part of a larger project where Amnesty used many methods to document um, the effects of the US-led coalition bombing of Raqqa, Syria, which was intended to um, oust ISIS and resulted in a large loss of civilian lives and homes. This interactive exhibition was comprised of photographs, videos, satellite images, and maps, as well as a 360 degree immersive experience um, of what it was like to stand in the middle of one of these bombed out buildings done with virtual reality goggles. So, this was labeled an ex exhibition and not necessarily overtly labeled art, but it followed the aesthetic convention of kind of wall hangings and the layout of an exhibition and um, flow through it and was held in artistic spaces. And this of course um, is last week and the beginning of the painting in huge yellow letters of Black Lives Matters on a stretch of 16th Street in Washington DC near the White House. So the DC mayor, Muriel Bowser and her staff uh, thought that one of the things they could do to make a physical commons um, really apparent in a city close to the White House um, was to, to, let, to sort of put out a mural um, on the street. And so what they did was they asked a bunch of um, local artists to design it. This is what they came up with. Um, and this resulted in what the New Yorker calls, quote, the newsiest piece of public art in recent memory. So in summary, we have here three examples of art institutions, practices and people who are embracing accountability projects. So next I'm gonna look at three artistic projects that bumped up against the accountability sphere. So these are cases I've been looking at for quite a while in my research um, and previously um, until thinking through the themes of this, of this panel on the cultural commons, i had been thinking about these cases as examples of digital fakery. And you'll see what I mean when I describe them, but um, and thinking about this talk, I began to see them in a new light 
I began to focus on them as the art that their creators um, deemed that they were and as knowledge projects as well. So this was a video that went viral on YouTube in 2014, showing a young boy rescuing a younger girl amidst apparent sniper fire, purported to be a civilian witness video in Syria. Um, the BBC did an investigation and discovered it was actually a film shot on the same location where Gladiator was filmed using child actors with a Norwegian director funded by the Norwegian Film Institute and Arts Council Norway. As the director explained to the BBC, quote, if I could make a film and pretend it was real, people would share it and react with hope. By publishing a clip that could appear to be authentic, we hope to take advantage of a tool that's often used in war, make a video that claims to be real. We wanted to see if the film would get attention and spur debates, first and foremost about children and war. We also wanted to see how the media would respond to such a video, end quote. This is a comparable project that received a lot of news coverage in 2015. And this was Instagram account, um, which purported to be the selfie documentation of a migrant's journey from Senegal to Spain um, and included um, pictures, selfies snapped of um, a, a man walking, hiding in a car boot, landing on the beach in Spain, worrying about approaching police um, and then wearing a gold thermal blanket on the way to the center of internment. This was all written out in the captions. Um, and the one with the gold blanket, one um, also had sort of hashtag gold, hashtag fashion, hashtag Insta daily, which is what kind of raised people's <laughs> questions about whether this was really what it said it was. Um, and this was revealed as, as a fiction, as an art project in the last post, um, which I put up here, um, stating, quote, thank you friends for all the attention, the support and the debate. This Instagram experience was based on the real experience of thousands of people that every year risk their lives for a better future, showing that other realities exist and are closer than what we think. So this Instagram account was made by a Spanish production company as a promotion for an international photography festival. And in a press release, the production agency said that this account, quote, acts as a reflection on the way we process and share images of displacement and migration in established media and on social networks. And someone who worked on the campaign said, quote, the narration of reality is always in the hands of people with power, not in the hands of people living that reality. So the third and, and final um, example in this section I wanted to show you is the 16 video. Now this is a little bit different. Um, it shows a rescue of someone trapped in rubble in Syria by two white helmets, the Syrian civil defense group who've been nominated for the Nobel Pre Peace Prize for their rescue work except the rescue seems frozen in time. And it's a version of the mannequin challenge, which is a mimetic genre that swept through social media in 2016, maybe you remember it, where the subject stays still while the camera pans around them. It was filmed by the media group, Revolutionary Forces of Syria and featured two white helmet volunteers. Someone from RFS told CNN that they titled the video with a mannequin challenge hashtag because they wanted to quote, reach the Western audience and show them part of the Syria suffering. So this wasn't produced by creatives or artists and wasn't purported to be real, but I wanted to include it to talk about the really strong backlash this video received from members of the accountability sphere for an attempt to even slightly engage with fictional genres by an organization that besides conducting rescues also documents war crimes along the way. So this backlash from the accountability sphere was also in response to this kind of gleeful um, uh, public reaction from um, uh, voices, pro-Assad voices and pro-Russia voices, such as the article that was put out um, almost immediately by Russia Today. Um, the article title ironically calls for white helmets to receive an Oscar for this acting. Um, and this article said, so realistic, it's raising serious questions about the authenticity of the white helmets other frequently posted videos. So the White Helmets told the BBC, quote, um, we took immediate action to discipline those involved and prevent incidents such as this from happening again. Our volunteers are committed to saving lives by responding to and reporting war crimes in Syria. This leaves us open to attacks, not just from the bombs, but from those who seek to silence us for telling the truth. So it wasn't just um, this, uh, project that was that received denunciation, but all three of the ones I've just shown you of art projects um, bouncing into the, uh, the accountability sphere 
that had received um, significant denunciation by individuals and institutions in the accountability sphere. So with the Syria boy rescue video, there was an open letter signed by prominent names in this space um, saying, quote, it is reckless and irresponsible to distribute a fictional film as real footage, thus belittling the very real suffering of Syria's children and the very serious work by professional and citizen journalists inside Syria. Um, about the fake Instagram account, a storyful journalist wrote, quote, the Abdu Diouf account, which in fact was created by a Spanish production company, is emblematic of the hazards that come with taking what we see on social media at face value. So here I wanna stop for a minute and consider the conflation of art and artifice that we see in these denunciations. So art and artifice have the same root word meaning craft. In other words, the implication is the knowledge they make is crafted rather than naturally occurring. Um, and naturally occurring say an out there to be like fact found, right? Um, so why does the accountability sphere have to denounce this so loudly? This is because I argue the proliferation of digital fakery and this sphere's position as made up of fact finders who will lose their ability to hold human rights violators to account if their reputations and thus their facts are tarnished by association with artifice. But artifice also means skill, including skill in moving us to new truths, new ways of knowing. Horkheimer and Adorno talk about transcendent art that can create critical awakening because it shows us a utopia and we wonder why our world isn't like that, or it shows us a dystopia and we worry our world will become like it. Both necessarily involve representations that diverge from the realities a fact finder would construct. So why doesn't the art sphere um, denounce the accountability sphere in return, or at least not as vocally? Um, it may be that for artists and their institutions, as that quote from the Tate implied, everything is a representation. Truth is already understood as subjective. And so another methodology for getting to truth is just that, another method and not a threat. On the other hand, we get cries of fakery when culture produced according to the art spheres set of conventions enters the accountability sphere. Um, digital fakery is often discussed in the literature as identifiable by intention to deceive. But I wanna take a step back from this and argue that can actually be a matter of clashing methodological conventions for, for producing truth, clashing epistemologies. And if we understand it this way, we can see that the categorical, categorical exclusion of art um, and artifice in that sort of wrapped up way um, that draws on anything but professional fact-finding methodologies is probably a bellwether of other exclusions. Um, exclusions that are not intentional, but rather that reflect the prioritizing of reputational risk over a plurality of epistemologies. And this matters because different standpoints, different identities and life experiences lead to different epistemologies. For example, as Patricia Hill Collins explains, when she was writing her book, Black Feminist Thought, she had to look far beyond, uh, within, but also far beyond academic institutions and academic registers in the US as their dominance by white male standpoints meant that black women have been excluded, not just in terms of membership, but also in terms of ideas. As she says, and I quote her here, um, white male controlled social institutions led African-American women to use music, literature, daily conversations and everyday behavior as important locations for constructing a black feminist consciousness, end quote. So she elaborates that her epistemological training in social science was not enough that she had to widen her epistemological horizons to see the full range of black feminist thought. So bringing this back to the commons, what are the implications? The commons need a diversity of knowledge projects. Um, they need knowledge projects that speak to fact finding, the language of many of our powerful political and economic institutions, but the commons also needs to be wary that accountability institutions conventions may govern people and may exclude people as do any strict epistemologies. So we need not just art, but also all kinds of projects. And here I've just put up a, um, the website of End Everyday Racism, which is a project I'm involved in at Cambridge. Um, uh, so the pro projects like this that embrace different ways of knowing, supporting a diversity of epistemologies and a culture of epistemological openness is of course not enough for making a plural and diverse commons. One where we can all see ourselves represented and can engage in different ways of learning teaching and communicating together. Um, art, art sphere institutions are notoriously undiverse and there are a host of intersecting inequalities that keep many of these powerful institutions in the hands of power. 
but epistemological diversity is a start. And I think we're seeing it increasingly in the commons right now. And that's where I'll end. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ella. That was so interesting. Um, I had no idea that your research actually touches upon those issues. That was um, a great surprise. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. Let's now move to Pelin. Pelin, you have the floor. Let me share. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you very much for um, inviting me. Um, my presentation um, is based on some of my engagement. Um, uh, are you, you, I guess you're seeing the presentation right now. Everything is okay, Constantin? Yeah, huh? okay. Um, I, um, I was more concerned uh, on in, 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 in really looking into non-institutional structures, non, um, a kind of infrastructure in a very both metaphorical and physical uh, way, um, what kind of threshold infrastructures is producing, reproducing, hosting, um, non-hosting uh, commoning practices. Um, I'm trying to understand um, this um, in, in, through that scale and uh, and I'm using a lot artistic and met architectural uh, methodologies but also I mean how um, artistic and architectural knowledge um, can um, gain a new way of looking to commoning practices but it's uh, at the same time how to contribute um, and um, uh, I'm really intending to always to uh, um, contribute or create um, non-institutional structures, um, para-institutional platforms, and, 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 and thinking through how much resilience is those infrastructures, um, either an art institution, non-art institution, either a refugee camp, or, or um, any kind of other um, structures. Um, um, I think uh, when we speak about commons, we speak about um, citizenship, property, um, solidarity, forms of solidarities, um, different kind of model modalities of working together. And uh, um, I, I do refer uh, many of my colleagues um, uh, that um, I inspired a lot. Um, Especially, for example, the, the feminist geographers Gibson Graham on um, uh, collective action and community economies, um, grassroots action, how to create minor economies and commoning practices. Um, Stavros Davides, uh, when he speaks about urban struggles in the in the marginal side of cities, um, how practicing uh, urban uh, commoning practicing includes a lot of negotiation and, and um, responsibilities um, to one another. Uh, female labor uh, by Silvia Federici when she speaks about commons. And the most important also, um, how we can think commons different than 70s theories of commons that is now more um, moving to not human-centric ecological understanding, but um, wider beyond the um, uh, non-human and um, and what Maria and Dimitris are speaking, eco um, um their work, their research, their writings. Um, I have some cases, some work that I'm involved. Um, one that especially the um, panel uh, conveners asked me to speak about a little bit about the silent university. Silent university is an art, uh, steam it come, came as an art uh, project practice by um, uh, artist Ahmed Oud, um, who was in an artist residency in uh, Tate Modern. And uh, it is interesting that Gavin was speaking about Tate also. Um, Tate asked the artist uh, to do a work in the migrant neighborhoods of London. And Ahmed said, no, I'm not going to go to uh, migrant neighborhoods. I'm, I'm an artist and I'm going to stay in the institution and I'm going to do this project in the institution. And um, uh, this was really less, uh, another topic to discuss, but this was really a struggle for the artists. I witnessed, I observed, um, we did an event called Alternative Education in Tate. Um, so I was a little bit um, 
witness the situation, it was really hard for the artists to start and sustain, uh, bring the migrants, um, undocumented asylum seekers, um, refugees, and official migrants to the to the state modern in the evenings for the for those silent university classes. Um, who were teaching and the classes and, and participating too. So this was uh, this was a project came out from this residency one year of Ahmed. And then um, <clears throat> he created a kind of a structure that everyone who wants to run a silent university branch can, um, can uh, uh, establish a uh, silent university by acquiring the, uh, the logo and uh, establishing a website and so on. And they can run themselves, anyone who wants to, um, the, in their city. Silent university is in some places, uh, especially in West Europe, where the cultural institutions are very uh, powerful compared to non um, European institutions, some of them, I would say, um, hosted in the institutions, like for example, Stockholm Tensta Kunsthalle, uh, the silent university is inside the institute. Uh, and uh, there is also, there are also um, independent branches like silent university Ruud or silent university Hamburg, who used to be in this institution and outside. So silent university is always playing uh, finding itself in an art institution outside of the institution and it depends on the how much this branch can be structured in in what kind of infrastructure with, with what kind of support and uh, uh, and many um, many activities are running by the immigrants by the undocumented uh, by the refugees I'm sorry I, I'm selling each of them because each of them has a different legal statue in different uh, countries West Europe England and or in Turkey and so on um, so I was involved more uh, to try to help establish um, uh, Southern University in Athens that the activists wanted to establish in Amman uh, in Jordan uh, in different kind of um, uh, places where actually the art institutions and activism are a little bit different than uh, West Europe. Um, and it gave me a lot of um, experience to understand how to structure such, uh, such an infrastructure in a different kind of urban precarities, in a different kind of level of activism, in a different place like Amman, where citizenship, refugeehood, or other kind of art institution is defined so differently than what we used to see in the West uh, <clears throat> um, in art institutional constellations. Um, for example, this is the slide in Athens that we did uh, uh, in Steki in Refugee um, Education Solidarity Center. After this uh, few workshop, the, the, the Greek, uh, my Greek colleagues, they said that they want to have a mobile uh, silent university, not a branch that has a space in a, in a building or in a, <clears throat> a refuge in an art institution, but a mobile car, maybe one that goes around the um, city of Athens and the refugee camp. This was a very interesting that Ahmed and me we were surprised to hear that um, if this, this, this can be possible or not, we, we, we were really um, interested in that proposal too, a kind of a mobile non-institutional um, infrastructure. <clears throat> um, we have cards, um, identity cards, and um, the, it works very well. Of course, it's fake, but you can go into museums um, and, and use it. We, with, with Ahmed, after, during our experience, it's a kind of a learning in different cities and different territories. And uh, I'm basically teaching a lot in, in academia also, and uh, we were very much involved how to really write a manifesto of um, transversal pedagogies. This is we wrote six, five, six, seven years ago. We will write maybe differently now. We are, we are is a kind of an ongoing process, but we were thinking silent, the silent university as a pedagogical platform um, by and for refugees and migrants and uh, it not it not only as a as a space of uh, of migration but also um, a space of um, a different kind of knowledge that comes together because this silent university got attracted a lot of academic people the ngo workers um, a lot of other kind of disciplined uh, architects people um, later uh, in a few years that they came 
us and they said they want to involve too. So it was very interesting that this, this platform was not only only for refugees and migrants anymore, but also academic and activist and other kind of disciplined people who are interested and looking for um, experience of commoning through alternative discussion of pedagogies and that includes discussion about citizenship, public space, institutionalism and, uh, and uh, borders, border policies. We produced a book that includes also criticism. There were many failures, um, um, failures of sustaining silent university branch, failing of um, um, other kind of means of racist attack or, or other kind of um, uh, issues that we had to face. And this book was somehow like including reports also from the branches, uh, what kind of issues that they deal with each branches. Um, I was um, also thinking about how to really think um, in include into curriculum and, and methodology um, in teaching uh, in the architecture faculties where I used to work in Mardin. Um, I'm based in Mardin, by the way, southeast of Turkey near Syrian border where I'm living. And uh, um, few, uh, I started to work in architecture faculty in 2013 that was newly established uh, th that time by my colleagues. And um, um, we were surrounded a lot, of, especially after 2013, we are 20 minutes to Syrian border and uh, in the city of Mardin, outside of the, around the Mardin, in the region, there are many re refugee camps, uh, official and also self-organized, non-official. I'm very interested, uh, was interested in um, self-organized camp. During that time, I was doing field research, um, looking to commoning practices in the, in the urbanized refugee camps in Jordan and in Palestine. and. Um, I'm on the um, pedagogical consortium of Taishe Refugee Camp uh, in, in uh, West Bank with A.L. Weisman. And uh, um, this camp has also created a, pro, uh, a kind of a collective initiative, pedagogical called Campus and Camp. And uh, I, we were like trying to create a translocal solidarity and that includes discussions and meetings and, and field research together. So um, first, this was a kind of a, what you see in the, res, uh, in the slide uh, with my um, graduate students, um, mostly master and PhD students, um, architects, urbanists. We worked in an Ezidi camp, uh, self-organized. Uh, that was a temporary camp for a one and a half year and doesn't exist anymore. Um, uh, and um, this was something that we examined the camp, the self, how they, they organizing themselves the um, Ezidi community uh, inside, but also um, how education unions, how uh, health unions, how NGOs like Doctors Without Borders, how Mesopotamia Ecology Association, local municipalities, how they engage in, 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 in organizing the camp and, and, and also um, um, the community themselves. Um, this was very important when my, my student asked me that um, when we started this um, research, it took uh, like uh, field visiting, meeting with them and uh, spending time also. But um, they were thinking that we will, they asked me, are we going to design a camp? And I said, no, um, it's already designed by the, especially by the AZD women. Um, and uh, all the design elements from lightings to corridors uh, was mostly designed by the woman there. And uh, um, so it was a kind of a case architecture without um, architects um, and the architects were the Ezidi women who were who came by walking from Shengal um, and, and accommodated in one night and accommodated by the local Kurdish municipalities in this place. What we did that we transformed the other way around. We, we archived their design um, and um, created a small booklet of, that includes a lot of visual archiving um, about their spatial environments and, um, and also their gardening um, activities. Um, um, this was very important pedagogically for my student to understand as an architect and urbanist that um, they don't need to design always. Uh, I mean, like they don't need to sit in front of um, sketch and AutoCAD and so on. They can also learn from the non-architects and from in an emergency temporal condition, how permanent uh, uh, 
um, infrastructure um, is, is being aimed. I mean, there's a permanent way of um, <clears throat> dwelling, although in a temporary condition, emergency condition, and, and they can see that how resilient is this infrastructure and how, although it's so precarious, this community, how they are strong in, in, in establishing their everyday life. Um, as it is, they're going to live tempor temporarily in this place. So it was very important, the temporality to think and, and the to think about the role of the design. And uh, we, we, we were also, <clears throat> we wanted to be in solidarity with Pink Pikpa refugee camp, which is a, is a, is a um, place in Midellini in Lesbos Island, is a solidarity buffer zone, um, uh, buffer place um, that, um, yeah, I see Constantin. I will finish quickly. Um, I, it was uh, it was important for me, uh, for myself, also for my student in a pedagogical structure, to see, to experience translocal solidarity, not something that is happening around us um, in Turkey, but where those people go, arrive by boat to to Pikpa and uh, and continue to Athens. Um, um, we were very much, I mean, I was trying to really create this kind of um, um, relation. I think common in practices is really about translocality, translocal solidarity. And, uh, and we conducted also um, the same with my student. Uh, I often go to Daisha Camp in West Bank that we are running um, some, some programs there uh, with the younger generation. Um, Palestinian refugees who are running campus and camp. And there the, the discussion about citizenship, art institutions, infrastructure differs really, differs, but we are discussing in the West, with the West West. So it was interesting for me to learn um, the scale of commons. Um, lastly, another that I worked and the, I wrote about, um, uh, not only uh, a camp, organized camp, designed camp um, outside of the city that we often know, but there is also um, like city plaza, the squat um, inside the city that the, that the activists um, wanted to really show that uh, refugees doesn't, there is a other way of commoning practices, a different kind of existing infrastructure and using the infrastructure differently for solidarity. Um, just want to close that um, um, Staros, um, he speaks a lot about how um, how commoning is, a, is an expanding open process. That was a discussion yesterday in the panel too, I think, um, who is including how to create um, newcomers and so on. Um, I just want to say something and conclude my, um, I, I really um, care that um, to create a, a new coexistence of um, um, community with researcher, with activists, um, that is not solely about NGO activism, is not about only about academic people and professional researchers, but it's not only about um, pure um, refugees um, that we are working only with refugees. I'm really interested that, and I believe that commoning practice is really about <clears throat> the play between institutional, non-institutional structure through using, in my case, um, art and architectural methodology and engagement, uh, but also how to really reach this coexistence and create new communities and societies is my, um, my um, strategies. And archiving and, uh, and engaging and creating translocal perspective through territories, it's very important. I hope I didn't forget anything uh, or I will tell later. Uh, thank you very much. Eileen, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. Um, first of all, let's invite people to uh, pose their questions through the Zoom chat. And then let's invite Sepake uh, for her presentation. Hi, everyone. Um, can you hear me OK? Yes, perfectly. Yeah, thank you. perfect. That's great. So. Firstly, I just wanted to say thank you to um, Cambridge University and to the organizers, um, and especially um, Constantinus, who has been, um, we've been in ongoing conversation, I guess, over the last um, years. Um, I'm, I'm going to have a bit of a messy presentation today because I think there's a lot of new ideas that are sort of surfacing through the kind of radical shift in time um, that we're going through at the moment. Um, I think I had, 
set my mind to kind of talk about things which had happened in the past, but um, I'm quite interested to use this platform and this moment to actually have, you know, live dialogue and con conversation and that some of the ideas might not be fully um, thought through, but that we could actually think through some of these ideas together. So for me, a real process of, of maybe commenting in terms of our resources and thinking. Um, so I've prepared um, something to sort of talk through uh, first, which I'm gonna read through, um, if that's okay. And, um, and then I might share some images that I've, I've kind of got in various places on my laptop. Okay, so, um, so our discussion today um, asks us to address how the commons uh, may operate within institutions of culture or cultural organization. Uh, today, I will speak from a personal experience um, and the projects that I would have worked on um, and I would like to draw from um, texts that I've read, but also reread through times of crisis and remind me of what the role of culture plays in these times. I'm using the word culture loosely, but perhaps it requires further definition, especially as I go on to address cultural institutions. When I refer to culture, I refer to the repetitive practices, um, the creation of narratives, ways of being and coming together that shape and construct our worldview, uh, the creation articulation and creative articulation through language and artistic forms that are socially reproduced. Um, my love for etymology of words, but also to see how the word is used within different languages, led me actually to ask uh, Konstantinos about how the word was translated into Greek. He said uh, to me that there were two possible translations, actually he gave me three, but I'm gonna just focus on two here. Uh, the first one was cultura, which sounds very much like the word culture, we, are, we know and understand, and uh, polit politismos. Uh, so one referring to the cultivation and the spirit, the education um, of the overall spirit, um, spiritual tra tradition, um, and the creative of a social whole or a social group, which of course makes us think of culture as homogenous and belonging to a people. And in the definition of the second, politismos, it refers to a totality of human achievements and the material and intangible creation of a people and its developments in order to meet its needs. And I find both of these definitions most useful in thinking about cultural institutions as it refers to the social production of people and the progression of the human or civilization. Immediately, I can see a rupture with these definitions as when I think about the enslavement of man, the full of people from their land their language and culture, and the removal and seizure of everyday objects as curiosity, which gives birth to the museum. This rupture with humans are deselected as humans um, in order to create the cultivated and the knowledgeable. The one that categorizes and names um, is the very culture in which is inscribed in the birth of the museum. So currently I'm the I'm artistic director of the Institute of International Visual Arts in London and I take my mandate from the first chair of the organisation which is Stuart Hall, um, the sociologist, um, cultural theorist and public intellectual that championed the organisation to make space for the emergent culture that derives from hybridity. Geographies, histories and um, narratives collide. But I'm not going to talk about Innova today, but my, about my experiences as an educator, curator, facilitator, and convener in some of the other projects that I've worked in, um, in more recent years. Um, so I'm going to sort of talk about partly some of the projects from the Chicago Architecture Biennial um, and a self-organized gathering under the mango tree. I hope that by looking at certain practices um, within these projects, we may begin to articulate what operating within the values of commoning might look like within cultural practices of institutions. After listening to the conversations yesterday and your presentations today, new questions have emerged um, in my mind. And that question um, th this morning was, I was working at, um, um, I'm working at a cultural institution, but 
Is it about the culture of institutions that we're going to address today? Is it about cultural institutions in themselves? Or is it the instituting of culture? And the second um, would be, what is the culture of the organizations that we work within? Um, I ask these questions because I would consider the institutions that I work in as public institutions. And of course, you can see um, how quickly I, you can fall into a rabbit hole as um, we heard in Gavin's um, presentation today, you know, what constitutes the public, what constitutes public space. And if, if they are public, truly public spaces, you know, who actually governs them? Um, who actually gets to say what takes place in those spaces? You might say that it means that the institution is open and accessible to all, but we already know that the word all could be um, heavily discussed as well, um, as it has been criticized of late when the movement of Black Lives Matter, uh, others have said all lives matter, and the recent pandemic has highlighted the in inequity and the effects of infrastructural racism at the fault lines of society. And when I say fault lines, I'm addressing institutions that support our social living and well-being, like housing, education, health, and I dare to say also culture. We have seen um, that there are disproportionate numbers of deaths that have um, occurred in the black and brown communities in the UK and the US and Brazil. Another question may emerge, which is, you know, why these three countries specifically? But again, I digress. This is not what I've been invited to discuss with you today. So for anyone who knows me, I like to ask questions and I often use social media platforms to pose those questions. A recent question I posed in relation to our current protest was, what should stand in the place of statues? Now, of course, I was not talking about all statues, but statues that have recently been torn down because of their connection to the production of racial inequality. The part they played within the transatlantic slave trade and therefore how society and culture has also benefited from the brutality and violence of slavery. Even today, I received an email from um, my local councillor in Southwark um, informing me that they were going to be conducting an anti-racist audit to identify statues and street names that do not reflect the borough's diversity, especially those that have been linked to slavery and the country's colonial past, and to identify positive opportunities for the celebration of more diverse figures. So as I begin to think through the commons and commoning practices of um, uh, of the, you know, the question that we've been kind of address, we're addressing today, what constitutes the commons and what are the values of commoning practices? There remains a question of how are the powers and power and resources redistribution, redistributed? How are they shared? This is a kind of um, non-violent revolution that we're seeing currently in some aspects. Um, and I'm referring here specifically to cultural institutions that needs to address the way in which cultural institutions are practicing. Um, Colonial West um, said a couple of weeks ago when he described this revolution as a democratic sharing of power, wealth, resources and respect. And without that, that's where you see the rupture and that's where you see the violence. As a strategy of care to practice the commons, this needs the space to develop the ability to listen to read the room, to ascertain the temperature, to attune the ear, and to read perhaps also requires spaces of intimacy that allow for difficult conversations, difficult knowledge to be heard, felt and understood before trying to enact change within institutional response. This word response, uh, here as opposed to reaction, because we can see a number of reactive statements that cultural institutions have made in the light of wanting to stand in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement. A movement that since 2015 has galvanized the public onto the streets across the world, but is spilling into the public spaces, cultural institutions, and are calling for demands beyond 
the performance of statements? How could cultural institutions respond to the present moment beyond the rhetoric of diversity and inclusion towards a politics of anti-racism and the fight for equality and social justice? So um, I don't know how, much, how I'm doing for time, but I'm going to, I'm going to not, please don't tell me that was just one minute, but I'm going to just talk about, um, Okay, perfect. Um, I'm going to talk about um, a, a couple of projects and I'm going to try and share my screen and I just hope that this works. Uh, okay, so I'm going to share screen. Uh, desktop. So you'll be able to see me for a moment, I think. And share. Okay, so you can see my desktop now, I think. Um, and one of the questions actually I asked um, was about digital intimacy. Like, what does digital intimacy look like? And I was thinking about that in terms of um, present the presentation I was putting together today. Because I was thinking, um, in some ways, the presentation allows for a sort of you know for clearing away of all the things that you don't want the public to see. Um, and in this time where we have been. Uh, having sort of meetings in our homes uh, where, you know, children and parents sort of intervene with our um, work conversations. We've had this kind of colliding of worlds. And I, I find it really interesting that we're sort of addressing this question of the commons, um, you know, directly from our homes, from our intimate and private spaces, and just sort of thinking about how, what does that mean to actually sort of have these conversations alongside our kind of, you know, uh, our, our lives. Um, so I'm showing you um, an Instagram from Under the Mango Tree. Um, so to just maybe describe what Under the Mango Tree is, um, I made an invitation. So I'm just going to show you what that invitation looked like. Yeah. So hopefully you can see that. I made an invitation to a number of people that actually I had invited for a project that I had done um, in... Um, in Documenta 14 first. And that came out of a number of conversations, a number of, um, of, of incidences and moments. Um, and one of those was the fact that Adam Shimchik, who's the who was the director, artistic director of Documenta 14, had been to Santa Nikitan and he came back and he showed me images of um, classrooms. And these classrooms were, um, mango trees that had been planted that allowed for shade that allowed for a space of people to come together and I was really struck by this idea of what does it mean to be able to um, come together but outside of the institution outside of the, the, the kind of construction the building of the institution um, and what other kinds of spaces could be created um, at the same time, um, I was also reading Paolo Freire because I'd been thinking very much around, you know, unlearning practices and decolonial practices. And um, I, there, I was really struck by this, this, this sentence that he, he's written while actually sitting under a mango tree and while standing alone and thinking what it means to be with. And um, that's something that's sort of stayed throughout um, both of the editions, the second one being in Santa Niki town itself. So to come under the shade of this mango tree with such deliberateness and to experience the fulfillment of solitude, emphasize my need for communion while I'm physically alone proves that I understand the essentiality to be with. And so um, I think <laughs> this is something that I'm really experiencing now, I guess, I think we all are in different ways, is that, you know, in our, um, well, in some time, some cases solitude, some cases not solitude, but in our sort of um, way that we've been, you know, isolated from one another. And actually, for me, you know, all of my practices are really very much about coming together. Um, this question around actually how the, the digital commons actually helps in a way to kind of bring us together is something that I've been really very much struck with. Um, but this project, you know, before, as you can see, like the third to the 7th of February, it was just before actually um, the sort of lockdowns were starting to happen in um, Europe about a month, I think about a month or so before. Um, although there were, another, obviously there were a lot of sort of uh, controls and measures kind of go happening at the same time. So 
So what what um what transpires in this kind of coming together for us during um um under the mango tree, I sort of bring together artists who are interested in who whose practices setting up schools, um, whose practice is an interest in libraries, whose practice is um, sort of artist-led initiatives that engage with the wider public. Um, and then um, instead of inviting them to give a presentation on those schools, I actually asked them to actually lead workshops or classes. Um, and so, um, you can these images that you can see here um, on the Instagram are just various ways in which um, people um, came together. Um, the image you can see over here is actually our registration. We kind of came together around in a big circle and the formation of a circle is very important. It's also for us, I guess, a symbol um, or a kind of um, a way of signaling um, uh, an enclosure, a production of space, a making of space. And um, we drew around um, the figures of each other, the shadows of our figures around of each other as a way of inscribing ourselves into the land to, to make a note that we had been there and we had come together. Um, and during this time, um, I think what's very interesting is how our bodies form um, different ways of being together. And in, in the beginning, um, I think we're very much sort of standing together, but we're not necessarily together yet. It's actually a practice. To come together is actually really a practice. It's something that requires openness and it requires um, a certain sort of dialogic exchange that allows for um, um, a kind of sharing and distribution of knowledge, as well as um, seeing it as a site where knowledge is actually produced. Um, this kind of connects back for me to um, a project that I've been working, I had worked on over the last two years um, with um, at the Chicago Architecture Biennial. Um, and I'm showing you here um, the foreclosed house of a project called um, the Sweetwater Foundation. And as you can see on um, in the image, um, the house is surrounded not by very many other buildings. Um, this project is led by Emmanuel Pratt, but his understanding of how to regenerate um, the neighborhood was very much about a question of how do you regenerate the land? Um, how do you reconnect um, people to the land? And so what he's actually developed is an urban farm. And the um, farm is um, not only um, a space of you know, growing, um, it's really a space of education. It's a spatialization of a pedagogy. He is really concerned with not only, you know, how do you um, reconstitute um, the, the relationships that have kind of broken down through the sort of breaking down of the of the um, environment. This is an area of um, Chicago, South Side Chicago. It's a neighborhood called Edgewater. It's a place which is um, known for actually, you know, the dumping of bodies as opposed to a place that people would walk or ever feel safe. And I think it's really important to reclaim these spaces. And I think that was one of the questions is how do you reclaim space? Um, and I think one of those questions around, you know, reclaiming spaces about how you make spaces safe. How do you um, create a place in which people can feel as if they can contribute? Um, I, during um, Chicago Architecture Biennial, and I think, you know, we'll have an opportunity to also sort of talk about some of the complexities of that project. Uh, I was really struck by the fact that we were located in um, 
the Chicago Public Library. That was, it was an ori original, the biennial is the Chicago Public Library. And I wanted to think about how some of these practices of being, um, you know, outside, being together, um, that I'd experienced in Under the Mango Tree could possibly be ways of thinking about um, developing a kind of cultural exchange. Um, I'm just going to just show a few images uh, that I have here. So this is um, the Chicago Library itself. And the Chicago Library is a really sort of decadent building. It's um, it has, you know, uh, the feeling of a kind of um, a space where you're, where people actually call it sort of the people's palace. It is a civic building and anybody can walk through its doors. It's free to enter. Um, but we were really interested in how the biennial might be able to tell other stories. Um, and the first story we wanted to tell was one of the land. So to acknowledge that, you know, Chicago is what we call it now, but who lived there before? Who occupied uh, those lands before? And how were those lands, um, how did they then become what we understand as the city of, um, of Chicago? So um, we spent... Can I just ask you to conclude your thoughts in order to have enough time for the discussion? Sure, for the conversation. Yeah. Sure. So yeah. this question for me about the acknowledgement of land and the acknowledgement of where we situate ourselves is so, I think, fundamental to uh, understanding the undoing of the institution. So, um, and what I mean by the undoing of the institution and cultural institutions is around the reconstruction um, and the sharing of resources, power, wealth, but also that this should be done in a way that allows for um, an emergent culture to evolve. Thank you. And sorry for going over time. Thank you so much, Apagia. Thank you for your um, wonderful presentation. We have a lot to discuss. Um, may I just uh, may I just ask, before we start our, our, our conversation, let's invite people to either uh, write their questions on the Zoom chat or raise their hands. We will first start the conversation between us. I will, we will unmute all the speakers now. Um, I have some questions for you um, uh, prior to the audience joining in. There have been some interesting connections between all of you, some amazing connections, I would say. Um, my first question, and I normally had to uh, address the question uh, to two of you to create this debate, but I think that all of you have touched upon uh, similar issues. So I think it's a, it's a more, it's a broader question. Um, so uh, as Zepakia mentioned in the wake of, um, George Floyd's murder, we have seen uh, many, uh, we have seen many statements of solidarity by major arts organizations and cultural institutions uh, against racism, police violence, uh, etc. Uh, however, while those museums and institutions are issuing th those statements, uh, at the same time, they are boarding up their windows and their lobbies to protect from the protests. Uh, MoMA announced a commitment to equ equity and justice while it continues to profit from prisons. There seems to be a discrepancy between um, institutional discourse production and the actual practices that those institutions uh, adopt. So my question is how we can pressure the institutions to become more accountable to return to Ella's uh, notion, more transparent, more democratic, uh, safer, as Pike mentioned, and closer to the communities they, they serve. I know it's a, it's a big question, but I think that it's at the core of the discussion and at the core of your presentations. Uh, whoever wants to go first, it's, it's up to you.
Shall I kick off? Why not, Sepaige? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I think that, um, I mean, I'll speak, you know, from my, my position, um, you know, I, I, my feeling was that this was an opportunity to reflect on, um, you know, who we believe our publics to be as a cultural institution. And um, there's been, you know, lots of conversation, but I felt that the first thing to do was to work out how to listen. So that's, that at the moment is something that we're, I'm sort of trying to think through. So it's how do we listen as an organization um, and to which, you know, publics do we serve? And so I think for me that those two questions will um, start to maybe form or shape, um, you know, what we might be able to do together. And then, then of, of course, there is a question around the sort of um, redistribution of resources. So if there are ways in which, you know, the resources that we have as an organization or the, um, or, or the access that we have maybe to certain people um, could be sort of, you know, more widely shared. That's, that's what we're kind of sort of trying to think through at the moment. And I think what's really interesting of this happening in this particular moment is that obviously um, the digital tools and resources that we have to hand become really like significant in, uh, in the way in which we have that conversation, which means that of course there is a certain percentage of society who don't have access to the internet, do not have um, computers or laptops, um, are then also somehow excluded from that conversation. So that's something to just sort of to, to bear in mind is that in terms of sort of thinking through maybe a digital commons in relation to culture is that there are still obviously people who are excluded from that conversation. I can say something. Please. Okay. Um, thanks. I think that's such an interesting question. I've been following this re with a lot of interest <laughs> remotely, you know, on social media um, and in the news. Um, and um, I think what has been really heartening about what we're seeing, um, because I agree, it's very problematic. You don't want to have this kind of discursive gloss over um, uh, commitments um, to justice and accountability and to democracy and to opening up that actually hide these kind of very difficult, um, very unequal practices. Um, but I do think that they are a first step in that. And you know, this is an old methodology of critique, but being able to shatter a discourse and show the practices underneath is a really good way to shift those practices as long as these institutions want to be accountable to us as publics. Um, uh, so that question of who, who, who the public is and listening, I think that's, really important um, what you brought up Sipake, but I, um, and I also think that this, this is um, a, a kind of a huge public reckoning using that critical practice of getting under the discourse and looking at the practices and then urging institutions to, to um, do what they say they're doing. Uh, I'm seeing it happening at my university. Uh, I'm seeing it happen, we're all seeing it happening in all kinds of institutions. So, and I, I haven't seen that method on this scale before in my life. Um, so I find it very heartening. Um, Konstantin, um, I want to say something. Um, I don't, but I don't know so much about um, public institutions. You know, it's not so much my field and so on. But um, um, I think this is the question you have is too general. You know, there are different kind of institutions. Um, um, budget administrative wise and uh, I mean public private and and so on and uh, transparency and uh, and um, like um, really um, touching to the engaging to the public whatever this public is it's again I mean these institutions have very um, white uh, middle middle upper class I mean if you, if you go to definition of what public is, it's also another problematic thing to discuss that why this institution, who are those institutions for whom? Uh, and this is another discussion. Just a little <clears throat> example, when Tate um, doesn't really want to host the silent university, 
um, for example, the silent university classes by the immigrants um, after 6 p.m. in the uh, in, in the museum. Um, they, they, they were also um, putting the class announcement in a very hidden side of the Tate Modern website. It was very difficult to find the public announcement event. Um, after a year, Ahmed was struggling a lot, but then um, he moved out to Silent University. Uh, also, his um, residency was finished too. Um, he couldn't deal with such a big institutions, you know, uh, that they want social engagement. Mm but they want it in the safest way, you know, safe and clean and clear, clean uh, and so on. They don't want any refugee undocumented asylum in the date or something. So they are not part of the public, yeah, let's say. And, um, mm. but then showroom and Delfina Foundation, they ask for help and they hosted for a while. And the library, Southern University has an extensive library with books about pedagogy, racism, migration, and so on, documents, and so on. And that time, Uta Meta Bauer was the dean of the Royal College of Art, and she held, she offered help to host the library because we didn't know where to put the library, to, to, to transform where. And Delfina and the Royal College of Art and showroom, they asked uh, for help, they, they asked, and, and we gave them, and later, Tensta Kunsale, Maria Lind, who was the director, she offered uh, help. So again, it was a little bit like, yes, these are small institutions, maybe different kind of institution, different kind of maneuver, uh, freedom of maneuver they have. Um, sorry for my Turkish English, I'm not a native speaker, but um, this was something like depending on the directors and uh, how they are feeling responsible on hosting such an institution that take doesn't want, uh, um, I mean, is, is, is ambivalence how, what they want, but we understood that they don't want. So it's, um, um, I'm speaking about London in the city, several different institutions and um, how uh, this uh, problematic engagement of art um, project was hosted differently, navigated differently, you know? And after a year, after two years, uh, Southern University was autonomous. Uh, um, so it is, it is very important to discuss uh, who the public is. Um, the public of those institutions are already, already not the public. Um, mm. We are, uh, it's not a heterogeneous public, you know, it's not a, um, mm. for me, um, such institution, uh, I don't feel any solution. They just should closed, closed, finished. I mean, the, some institution doesn't need to live forever. I mean, yeah. I thought it was me going to be banging on the tape, but like, well, it's, it's great. <laughs> provocative, I'm saying, but uh, we are in 2020, 21st century. We cannot go along with such institution, institutional framework anymore in speaking about culture and culture. Mm. Mm. I think I think one of the I really like this uh, the metaphor that Sepko broke up well not even a metaphor the the, the way of thinking about like the the ground uh, as a way to think about the common and the the hidden commons and making those visible and these as as a way of we've all been kind of thinking talking around around this idea essentially of like uh, the relations and the histories that that are hidden beneath these institutions and when they're brought out there are these these contradictions uh, between things like uh, the public statements, whether they're about uh, ecology, whether they're about kind of social representation or whatever that, you know, the, these institutions claim that their mission is going to be in each case. Um, but I think, it, I think it's also quite hopeful to think about those contradictions as opportunities. Often we think about those contradictions as like something that's quite depressing and damning, like, oh, they say this, but look, look at what they're actually doing or look at, you know, they're supporting, uh, you know, prisons or whatever else. Um, but to think about those as as revealing the ground, as revealing an opportunity, and that those are leverage points, that to to keep addressing those, and the fact that those things are becoming visible, um, is is a way of kind of forcing those institutions and forcing them uh, to move, or, or and, and a sign that they are being forced to move, um, and and to try and think to to always kind of remember it in that way, I think is is quite a positive way to think about these uh, what what might seem like depressing contradictions that emerge. And I think um, from what I understood here, the, the, there's, there seems to be three um, different methodologies that 
uh, all of you uh, touched upon uh, three different ways of critical interventions, um, either against the institution or from inside the institution or at the threshold of the institution. So th three mm -hmm. different ways to engage with them from what Gavin uh, presented, for example, those strategies and those tactics of interventions that can be inscribed into a general framework of artistic activism. You mentioned liberate Tate, BP or not BP. You know, there are many examples, decolonize this place, not an alternative. There's a long line of uh, strategic interventions with performances and unsac unsanctioned uh, interventions in order to use the institution as um, a site of ideological struggle and to leverage it to actually push it towards the right direction. Uh, we saw from what Pelin was, uh, me what Pelin mentioned about a different way of being situated outside of the of the official institution, with self-organized camps, temporary structures, para-institutional uh, formats, um, and the Silent University is a good example of that. Um, a pedagogical platform uh, that uses non-institutional spaces like squads, like uh, um, uh, activists, mobilizations, and functions in a translocal uh, framework. And then from what Sepake uh, and Ella uh, mentioned, I think there's another way of trying to uh, intervene in the museum from within. And this could be either with um, creating those spaces uh, for, for, for difficult conversations, for alternative, alternative pedagogies, um, or adopting a, a disobedient um, cura curatorial, let's say, approach. And, and my question to all of you would be, since you have done extended research and from your, from, from your own experience, can those strategies coexist with one another? Can they complement one another? What are the shortcomings uh, and the benefits of each strategy? And if we can just start unfolding those three different methodologies and see if they can work at a tandem or, uh, or not. I can answer my view. Um, which is, I think, I think it was a really nice way that you just pulled together um, the, you know, the, the knowledge shared across the talk. So thank you for that. Um, and in my view is, you know, critical interventions on all fronts. But I wanted to add one more dimension to the three that you outlined, which is a temporal one, which is um, that there are moments when these things grab hold. And I've written about this um, with a couple of colleagues when we were looking at the human rights space and how it was really kind of scrambling around in the digital, with, uh, with digital technologies. Um, and we borrow the concept of the knowledge contradiction. So whether it's a new technology, new actor, et cetera. Um, and that causes us, it actually uh, sort of denormalizes us. Um, Gavin, you were talking about normalization in the beginning. It, it, it sort of ruptures all of the normalization and naturalization um, of these practices around cultural production and the power institutions and hierarchies because suddenly it's something new and we have to work out how it fits in with what we're doing, how its norms align with the norms of our system, our spaces. Um, and when that happens, and I think we're really in one of those now, not just because of new technology, but I think we're watching our broader institutions reveal their cracks as they're stress tested through everything that's happening with coronavirus. Um, we are hearing, um, you know, lots and lots and lots of voices calling for change and accountability. Um, and so it feels to me that temporal dimension is that we are in um, a series of knowledge controversies, which makes this a really crucial moment to be acting um, uh, with critique and um, reform um, around our institutions. Thank you. Anyone, just feel free to jump into the discussion. It's an open. Yeah, I've, I've uh, I think it's really interesting that that you you have this debate in culture, which I think echoes in a way um, discussions you know people having elsewhere in in terms of political institutions more generally as well. And I think that for me, that at least that's how how my my brain works. That I've been framing it um, and thinking about this moment that we've kind of just come to the end of of. Um, what were kind of 
extra parliamentary movements, you know, since since at least the global justice movement being predominant, certainly in the UK uh, and also in the UK, US, giving way to this this kind of moment with uh, people like Jeremy Corbyn and Bernie Sanders, kind of an institutional energy and a, a kind of and the, that moment now coming to an end um, and l seeing lots of people moving back to the streets. It's also a generational thing, I think, is that you talked about time. I think that's worth considering that um, for a lot of younger people, they've, they, uh, they belong to certain waves of these movements. And a lot of them, um, people, people who are now uh, in kind of my, my industry, like people who are just becoming uh, lecturers, uh, at the moment and people who would be entering kind of arts organizations at a certain age were people certainly in the UK who were like 18 years old when in 2010 when uh, student fees became kind of prohibitively expensive and people's vision of what the future was changed radically uh, and that those people are now kind of uh, entering into these institutions I think there are some real kind of generational shifts to think about that are going on uh, mm. in terms of people's people's position with large within larger institutions that also uh, are kind of shaping this moment um, and that there is is a lot of younger people then haven't also the, you know that they're perhaps coming to a kind of uh, these wider street protests out of a moment where there, there was a kind of lot of institutional hope or a little inst a lot of institutional hope pinned uh, w which was a, a kind of unique set of experiences um, and I think all of those dynamics of being you know of the the common of the the counter power of a movement in the streets uh, and and kind of institutional positions um, as, is, has changed a lot over the just over like the past even five five years um, and, and is really kind of framing a lot of what's happening at the moment. Um, I might just jump in and read some questions from the audience if that's okay unless Pauline you're raising your hand do you want to quickly respond before I do that? I, I was thinking what Constantin was asking how this tandem um, can is possible. Um, so I was thinking and thinking in my head, no, it's not possible. No, it's not possible. <laughs> uh, it's <laughs> because uh, um, um, it differs so much that um, in different institution have no um, consolation. They have different policies, different scales, and um, how to really collaborate and balance is very difficult. It's difficult, different also in Europe, in England, in Turkey. I mean, for example, there is a depot in, in Istanbul that um, I, uh, I was part in constructing it with the owner, uh, Osman Kavala, who is in prison now. Um, and this uh, art institution in the neighborhood, which I, I used to live near the space too, um, was kind of an open space for different kind of discussion and different kind of level of public and engagement uh, and so on. It's still, of course, it's still going on. Um, but the, the, the runner, the owner is in prison, yeah? And uh, so the, the outcome, the, the, the tandeming um, is so, uh, has a different outcome in different countries and territories, yeah? And uh, so this is very difficult to think. Um, how such institution, non-institution um, movements can entangle um, to each and, and create a wider um, um, heterogeneous institutional constellation is very difficult. And uh, this is why I'm thinking how this can be possible. I want to go back lastly to Stuart Hall. He was mentioning about in one of his writing about alliances, um, how to create alliances and uh, how um, alliances um, can be temporary and permanent um, in different mm. kind of movements. I think uh, still this is very important to go back to Stuart Hall, um, how he um, um, gives some strategies and tactics and thinking uh, to us. Maybe instead of tandem, I mean, alliances could be something to, do, to go further with. Thank you very much. Thank you, it's very fascinating. And I think this question could relate perhaps. So I'll just read it, it's uh, addressed to anyone who wants to answer. Um, how are we to understand the relation of the commons to the private, but especially to the public institutions such as the public museum, the public library, etc. Laura yesterday mentioned um, Esposito's work on, commu on community and the commons. For him, the public is not the same as the commons. 
he writes about how the public has in fact often been used to reduce the space of the common. So I'm wondering if any of you have any thoughts about that. That's one question from the Zoom. And also another quick thing is how can researching, writing and speaking about the commons be a contribution to the commons? So another question from the audience. And, and if we'll have time, I think me and Alex have some more questions as well, so. <laughs> Yeah, but everyone just, you know, it's it's a informal open discussion. So anyone just feel free to. I, I think um, uh, writing, researching to come is very important um, beside taking part. Um, um, the only thing is that without experience, it's so difficult to write about. Um, but um, at the other hand, uh, there is other um, researching and writing about commons is so important in the academia, I think it really affects and change, can have the power to change the academic discourse in social science, in art and architecture. Um, our universities are getting more, 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 more conservative. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's a global thing, not only local. Um, and um, uh, even in Turkey, academics are being considered terrorists, you know, it's, it's like the, we're doing crime, something like that for the government. So it's very important to write and publish and research more. And there is so many level and scale to be researched and, 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 and write about in different kind of territories, not in, only in US or Europe, but in Lebanon, for example, in, 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 in China, in a little village, for example, there are so many different uh, practices that, um, that, uh, that is very much, um, e I mean, I don't want to say easy, but really accessible to understand and go into it. It's not so foreign to us, but it's a different scale, different kind of discussion with different kind of historical roots and, and, and contemporary oppression. Um, so it's very important in that sense to really bring different kind of variation and um, practices together in writing and researching. I mean, I think I would agree that um, the writing, writing and research uh, in relation to the, com to the practice of the commons is really important, really significant, because I think it's also um, that's how the sort of it also charts the maybe the progression of thinking around the commons, right? Because I think a lot of things have already shifted in thinking through um, you know, commons of practice of the commons, especially within cultural institutions. And I was thinking about this in relation to Casco projects in Utrecht who, you know, changed their model of a cultural institution at, you know, as a, you know, practicing the commons. So it's kind of, um, uh, it's not only, I guess, the writing and the research that, um, that I think that cultural institution specifically was reading. And so it's also how it's then enacted uh, and then how that is then reflected upon. So I feel as if it's a, con it's a continuum, it creates a continuum and, um, and it also may be, uh, creates then the dialogue between, potentially between generations. Yeah, oh, go on, please. Um, go ahead. I, I, I was only just gonna, yeah, briefly say, when I, I was also thinking about that in terms of um, when I'm in a, you know, in a, as an academic or as a curator, you're obviously in a position of uh, power in which the com commons are, are vulnerable. Um, and and I know you mentioned uh, Paulo Freire earlier that it, you've got a case where you've got you've got to kind of be your research questions or your or question to display have got to be led by the commons uh, and of service to them. That the research you do has to, has to kind of benefit them rather than benefit. You have to think about your relationship to, to the institution and, and who, who, who you're amplifying and who you're benefiting, of, of course. Um, I can jump in because uh, I'm looking at the other questions and I see the answer I was going to give, I think, relates also to Joseph's question. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, go yeah. ahead. Okay, so Joseph's question is, does the commons have to be reconceptualized given that it's mediated by commercial actors and political interests? Um, for example, Zoom's actions in China, Hong Kong. Um, and so uh, in terms of the role um, of, and, and Gary, I take your point about thinking about extractivism. Um, I, I'm not gonna talk about that at this moment, but I see, I, see what, I see your point there. What I wanted to say is that I think, particularly in lockdown, 
when our commons like right now are being mediated by these commercial technologies that have particular logics that are profit driven that are actually probably not at all aligned with things like this, right? Um, or, or any kind of um, gathering um, that we would recognize as a commons. Um, uh, the, the, the being in these spaces, these infrastructures of technology that are absolutely imbued with these logics of commercialism and profit, um, it kind of normalizes these logics and, and then sort of naturalizes the way that, that we interact and, and um, how we think we can be together online. So we're being, we have to mold ourselves to this logic and then we almost, that creates opportunities for that logic to almost come on board. And so I think um, the, practice of reflection on commons, which isn't just this idea of sort of academics um, writing about it uh, necessarily, but it's anyone involved having a, a space for reflexivity, um, for uh, thinking about, you know, exposing and thinking about other ways of understanding the commons in the face of this really strong shaping narrative that comes from the platforms when we're digitally mediated. All of that is really important to preserve the norms and the values that we want to share in the commons when we get together. So I think that that's a really important role for um, anyone in the commons who's um, speaking and writing and reading and et cetera about uh, these spaces. Do you want to come back to this uh, idea of uh, extractivism a bit more explain the concept? Because I think someone asked about it and I'm not familiar with it either. Um, I can, I can say what I think uh, it means there, mm -hmm. um, uh, which is that, you know, this idea of sort of taking the, taking the stories and accounts of um, people who are involved and turning them into kind of academic outputs. Um, I think that's what is being talked about there. Uh, maybe I got that wrong, Gary, I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> and I think this is, this is always something that we have to think about when we do use other people's um, stories and accounts and narratives. Um, in our own work. And so our own work needs to be responsible to um, them, uh, people that we've talked to and looked at, um, as well as to um, our broader uh, aims. Um, I mean, that's quite interesting because it seems to relate also directly to, um, yeah, just thinking about the way in which cultural institutions actually perform. It's very much about that kind of extractivist um way of thinking so it's quite interesting Ella that you sort of yeah sort of talk about how, the ways in which those narratives um you know who, who gets to tell those narratives and I think that's something obviously as um as a curator and as an organizer that's you know that's that's the sort of democratic sharing that I'm interested in in relation to the kinds of spaces that I work in if, if they're truly public um how can you kind of um democratize that space but also give re resources to it because it's you know there, there are also forms of labor that are involved in that so that's yeah sorry that was just that's what you just said that just really sparked that thinking for me i think there's a great question here from max do you want to read it yourself or i'll go ahead okay and um, so what are the panelists views on making sure that museum and galleries digitize their collections and dedicate the digital collections to the public domain? Thinking about these ideas of who's telling narratives. That's my addition, sorry, I'll just read. Um, so particularly for digitizing of work that are out of copyright. Uh, is this a valid approach to reclaiming the cultural um, comments by allowing different publics to access the artifacts digitally when physical access is limited, as well as allowing for the retelling and remixing of the cultural narratives related to these collections and artifacts. And yeah, you can all see it in the chat as well if I wasn't clear in my reading. I wonder, I wonder if I may um, jump in as well and add to that question to sort of bring it um, pull and I hope you're okay with this, Max. Um, to pull it out a little bit more, and and it ties in a little bit what you were saying, Ella. Um, but the the use of digital and digitization as a space, um, cyberspace or the virtual space, <clears throat> and you you've all four talked about it um, as as a tool um, of accessing, um, you know, organizing. Um, and Sabaki, notwithstanding your, your quite um, timely intervention that it is not even accessible to everyone, so it's already a privileged space. But I wondered, is it, is it also now being considered or used, and I'm thinking of social media and, and things like that, as a common space in itself where people come online 
Um, it, and do you consider it a good replacement for um, physical common spaces, galleries, museums, the um, institutions you have been um, critiquing, um, or do you consider the digital um, technology is merely a tool to augment or interrupt or some other way those traditional institutions? Um, and I don't, I, Alar, I know this is um, something I'd throw at you a, a little bit more. You, you've talked a lot about um, um, what social media and, and um, things is doing as a, as, a, as a corrupting influence in truth um, and, and narratives and knowledge, but um, I don't know, I'm going to throw it to you. I don't know if you want this one um, before like the others um, take it. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's so funny how one's perspectives change based on uh, crises. And um, I was ultra critical of social media platforms um, and the way that, you know, you know, opaque algorithms, et cetera, were shaping, um, you know, what we see, the way that search engines, as uh, Noble's written about, are inherently racist. These kinds of things are very much in my thinking and teaching. And then I got into lockdown and it was like, well, <laughs> I got to use them, you know, and, and, I, and I mean, I'm on them and I'm on Zoom all the time and Microsoft Teams and whatever platform that's commercial, I'm probably on it. Um, and so um, I think that we, we can't have a perfect version of, uh, you know, we can have a perfect vision, you know, vision of perfection, but our current version is never going to be a perfect version um, of, of what we want to see, what we want it to be like right now. And I think we have to make do with what we have. That said, I think that you know these um, huge pushes for change that we're seeing um, right now around Black Lives Matters and um, other areas of inequality. Uh, I hope that they start spilling over too to these social media platforms because I think again we are um, really, really large constituencies and publics who um, can, you know, we're trapped on them right now, but we can in some ways inflect that from within. Um, through advocacy. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, I'm sure it's someone who's like really into uh, research and on archives would have a really uh, more complex answer to this than, than, than I would. Um, but I think, I think that question of, of, of what digitizing is also like in t when I'm thinking about just like museum collections, um, there's a colleague of mine who was recently asked to, um, digitized the, one of the university collections and she re, she replied with a meme of um, Sean Bean in, Bean in Lord of the Rings and he's, he's doing it. One does not simply digitize the collection uh, and thinking about that's actually a really, you know, a complex thing that you're asking someone to do and there are all these kind of relations of power in it. When even if you think about uh, the access to collections, uh, a lot of museums, if you th think of a place like the V&A and it's kind of photography and print archives, anyone can go in those rooms and access all of all of these kind of historical artifacts, posters from social movements, all sorts of stuff. But not not anyone is going to go in that room. If you're like uh, a young person, if you're not uh, culturally kind of acclimatized to feeling like you have access to that space, that you can just bowl into a room in the V&A and knock on the door and say, "Hey, can I look at your posters?" Mm -hmm. Then you don't have that access. And I think we might think of of digitizing a collection as providing that access, but I'm not entirely sure whether it always does because those same kind of barriers still exist online um, and those same issues of access as well as all of these questions of how of, of what's being digitized and how and like what what are you what are you getting when something is is made digital what what information what perspectives uh, are being shared online um, I think I think that's that, that's very much a, a kind of a, a, often things like critique are kind of cut out of digital collections and the ability to sort and organize those collections in critical ways is very limited. Mm -hmm. We've got some questions from the audience, right, Alex? And people have raised their hands. Yeah, um, what, if you four are all right, just to carry on a few more minutes, um, we're just gonna stop the recording um, and then ask 